TV7 has the privilege of being in Branson, Missouri today, and we're visiting in the home of Gary Paxton, singer, songwriter, producer, just uh, kind of a, a person who has been involved in a lot of things, not only the music industry, but we're learning. But I've, I've lived 250 years so far. 250, 250 well, you're doing 250 good. years up to the time I got saved in 72, and then 250 years since then. Well, let's go back well, to... Well, the reason I have to use Gary S. Paxton Sr. is because I have a senior and a junior and a third, and there are 75 Gary Paxtons on the Internet. Oh, my goodness. So you have to kind of designate which one's which, yeah. uh, especially yourself. Yeah. So I, I want to start back before 1972. So when you were born and raised in Coffeyville, Kansas, tell us a little bit about your early childhood. Well, uh, it was pretty strange. Uh, I never found out I was adopted until my real mother showed up uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, Hollywood. But uh, anyway, going back to the beginning, I lived on a farm uh, halfway between Coffeyville and Independence, and we had no electricity. It was an old schoolhouse that my parents were trying to build into a house. And when I was seven years old, I was sexually molested by this big monster that lived next door to us uh, across the field. Uh, for a couple of years, and then uh, we didn't have no lights. This was before the REA came through, and so my bed was a pile of sheetrock in the front room for about four or five years. I slept on a pile of sheetrock. That got me ready for all the jails I was going to be in later, and also for sleeping in all the park benches in Hollywood. When Hollywood, when the people that uh, all had uh, eight million sellers before I was. Uh, 19 and never got paid anything on any of them. But anyway, so here I am in Coffeyville, Kansas. I get spinal meningitis, and we moved to uh, we moved to uh, Tucson, Arizona, because my dad got a job out there with NASA putting Alan Shepard on the moon, and because uh, he was an excellent machinist, he was with Hughes Aircraft, and uh, of course I uh, had had spinal meningitis. My fever was 112, and I lost 68 pounds in four days. That's how bad I got. I was a fat farm kid, and I lost 68 pounds in four days. And so uh, it left me for about six years like this. I couldn't do nothing. And so I got me a buddy, Holly Stratocaster, and became the Elvis Presley of Tucson, Arizona, won Entertainer of the Year, and had the number one band, because and backed all the big stars like Chuck Berry and Buddy Knox and uh, Eddie Cocker and all of them that came through with my band called the Rockabilly because they thought it was part of the act. You know, I did my Elvis, you know. But actually, I did, for six years, I couldn't control myself, see, so. And when, when you have you, something like that, you might as well make some money out of it. Right? When did you first, you know, you told me that you first became interested in music at a very, very early age. Ten. I started writing songs when I was ten. And, uh... I thought something was pretty strange because uh, my mother couldn't whistle, my dad couldn't pat his foot, and my brother and sister, you know, me, they hated music. And here I was, all I did was beat on things and play things and do this and do that. So I started writing when I was 10 and playing steel guitar, playing. Uh, Jerry Burns was the number one steel guitar player at that time. He was that steel guitar player from Hawaii that worked for Eddie Arnold and everybody. Jerry Bird. Uh, he played the flat you know, just flat steel, and there was no pedals or anything. But then the pedal steel guitar came along, and I was the first one to ever get one of those in Tucson when I was 14. But uh, at 14, I had the number one band in Tucson, Arizona, Gallup, New Mexico, uh, uh, Las Cruces, Farmington, uh, and then Yuma, I went all over, you know. And uh, I guess because I was so crazy, you know. <laughs> You talked about Fort Huachuca Military Inn. Though, we played there every Friday night for a long time. Everybody's heard of that. You talked about uh, working to earn your first amp and your first guitar. A lot of kids today probably couldn't realize because most people either they have a job that pays minimum wage or either they have parents who can furnish them with a musical instrument. My, my dad, we had this. We had this Sears catalog, and I wanted this guitar. Uh, it cost eleven dollars. And it was a silver, silver, silver oh. tone. But it was a silver one. And uh, in 19, uh, well, that would have been, I was 10, that would have been 1949. Uh, that was a lot of money, you know, $11. And so my dad did something. He, they were Christian people that had adopted me. And, and uh, but he did something that 
really drove me to what I became. I said, I want that guitar more than anything. I want that guitar. That's all I said for three months. I want that guitar. And finally, he took a pair of scissors and cut it out. And he said, okay, there's your guitar. You got your guitar. <laughs> and so that upset me so much that I went out and I went next door to this guy that had this big corn patch. His name was Charlie Charlesworth. And he owned about 100 acres. And he had this 38, 36 acres of corn. And he also was the physical ed instructor at the local high school in the city, in the big city of Coffeyville, 28,000. I lived out in Cedar Bluff where it was uh, uh, about 400. Anyway, so I, I said, uh, can I, I know you've been wanting somebody to hold the cocoa burrs out of your cornfield. So I went down there and it took me a month and a half to hoe all the cocoa burrs out of 36 acres. Because don't forget, I still had to go to school. And I had to get up every morning. And we had 200 rabbits, and we had 100 chickens, and we had cows and horses. And I would have to feed and water all those animals before I ever got on the school bus every morning. And so then I'd come home at night and do all that. And while it was still light, I would go down. And then on Saturday uh, and Sunday afternoon after church, I would go down and hoe all the cocoa burrs out of this 34 acres of corn, and uh, he paid me, he paid me $11, and my dad got really mad at him, and he went over and said, you give that boy another 20, he worked a month and a half doing those cocoa birds, but that's how I got my first guitar, and, uh, and then I did some more work around the area uh, for uh, farm work, you know, I'd, I'd go out and uh, bail hay, back in them days, you didn't have hay balers, what you had, you put the hay baler in the middle of the field and all these rakes would bring the hay up and you'd throw it in. And then as soon as I got big enough to, to pick up 75 pound bales, they put me back on the trailer. So they would, the bales would come out and they'd throw them in a stack and then I'd have to put them on the trailer and take them to, help them take them to the barn. But still, your number one interest was music. Oh, who, I, who in that all, day influenced you most? Because you became a songwriter. We're going to talk about that. Well, my that. number one, uh, uh, it's really strange how life works. My favorite country singers were, uh, were Don Gibson and Porter Wagoner. Uh, when I used to mow lawns, too, in town, I'd go in town mow lawns, and, and uh, I'd have a, people have a radio string an extension cord out, and I'd listen to Porter Wagoner on the radio and Don Gibson, and my favorite rock artist were the Comets and uh, Ray Charles. And so 30 years later, Don Gibson cuts my song and it goes to number one, sells a million. Ray Charles cut it uh, 12 years later after that, sold a million and a half. And then I produced Porter Wagner and 150 stars on a record that was in the Chicken Soup for the Country Soul book. It sold a million books. Uh, uh, what was the name of that? Uh, fam uh, uh, in the Shade of the Family Tree, that was in the Chicken Soup book. And they, they used my CD that I produced on 150, 105 stars in Porter. And then I produced the uh, Comets when they were here at the Dick Clark Theater. So my two favorite uh, country and rhythm and blues artists and my two favorite rock artists, I wound up producing all of them or having songs cut by them. We're going to take a break. That's pretty uh, strange, isn't it? It is. But we do want to take a break. We're coming back with Gary Paxton. We're visiting in his Gary home. Gary S. Paxton. Uh, excuse senior. me, Gary S. Paxton. That's senior. Like there's a senior. There's several on the internet. So we 75. We want to distinguish Gary S. Paxton Sr. here. And he is a singer, songwriter, producer. And you will know of some of the songs he has been involved in producing as well as a very uh, famous gospel song that he I don't penned. know about the singer part. Well, you might be pretty good. <laughs> so stay tuned. We'll be back here. I never right thought here. of myself as a singer. Just as Let me get back out. And we're back here. We're at Gary S. Paxton Singer's home Woo! right here in Branson, Missouri, where we're visiting with him. He's a singer, songwriter, producer. And uh, uh, we're going to be talking with him now a little bit more about his life That's story. That's one of my kids uh, crowing there. No. Is that your kid crowing? Okay. No, my wife has a rooster clock. I, I, I collect pictures of Jesus and clocks. I got about a hundred pictures. I want to have the world's largest collection of pictures of Jesus. I got going back to 1902 and then uh, I've got about a hundred clocks so that's uh, time and timeless. 
That's exactly right. Well, I want to pick up on your story. As you said, uh, you uh, get, you became interested in writing song, wrote your first song at the age of 10. 10, yeah. And uh. then uh, from there you had a band that w had gained quite a bit of attention. Yeah, we were number one entertainers in Tucson, Arizona. And uh, really number one, we were the first rock band really in the whole Arizona area, you know, because everybody else was doing country and they were doing pop, you know. and. But even back then, like most people think, your dad thought, well, you'll never amount to nothing yeah. if you don't have a regular eight or nine. You got to say, you need to learn a trade. You need to learn a trade. He said, show business ain't no trade. And, uh, well, I don't know. He was making 128 a week, and I was making 75 a night when I was 14, so I thought it was a pretty good trade to me. And, uh, you know, I just, I didn't want to be anything except a songwriter and uh, have a band, you know, and I really didn't even want to be an entertainer. That's why during all the years I recorded from uh, 55 to 75, I used over 150 different phony names. And that way, whenever one of them would be a big hit, I'd go down, well, when I was in Hollywood, for instance, I'd go down to the Hollywood Legion Lanes and Jimmy Seals of Seals and Croft was the house band at the Hollywood Legion Lanes bowling alley. So uh, people say, this was after I'd uh, done about four or five years of those Dick Clark and Alan Freed tours. And uh, I did a lot of Alan Freed tours because Cherry Pie, one of the records I'd cut in 56, uh, everybody went to number one, everybody thought we were black. So we get book booked on these tours like the Apollo and different plays. <laughs> Maybe Jackie Wilson, Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, the Flamingos, the Coasters, and Skip and Flip. And, Oh, uh, uh, Alan Freed would look out there and he said, oh my God, there's not one white person in the <laughs> audience. And so he said, run out real quick and start singing, cherry, doo doo doo, cherry. Bye. And so we'd run out on the stage and 5,000 black people, you got to remember this is 1958, 59, they go, ah, like, see these white people. Well, you know, I want to talk for just a moment. You were the top band at that time, and how did you? Yeah, but see, how I was did you in get Tucson. from Coffeeville to Hollywood? Well, in Tucson, Arizona, uh, eighty-three when I when I lived there, eighty percent, eighty-three percent of the people were Spanish or Mexican or Indian, and so if you was a white boy, you could have all the Pachuco gangs. You couldn't go to school unless you had a machete in one hand and a bicycle chain in the other to keep the Pachuco gangs off of you, and so that's how I grew up as a teenager. <laughs> but when did you actually leave Kansas and decide to travel to Well, California? my folks uh, left uh, Coffeeville, I think I was uh, 11 or 12, something like that. And moved to Tucson. And moved to Tucson because he had a big job out there. And then from there... Alan Shepard on the moon. At, from Arizona, did you travel to California then? Not for a while. I was in Arizona. Uh, that's when I had the Rockabillies and uh, had became Entertainer of the Year in uh, Tucson. Uh, I was either 14 or 15, and I was the only one doing rock and roll. Nobody else did rock and roll, but they had, there was a place called the Tucson Gardens, and they'd have all these big country shows, and after midnight, they would bring rock and roll bands in, and so they brought Chuck Berry in, and they'd bring Eddie Cochran in, and, uh, and Buddy Knox, and Dickie Doo and the Don'ts and all these people, and they would have my band back them all. And that's why later Chuck Berry said, I don't want to be booked nowhere unless Paxton's band, the Hollywood Argyles, is there backing me up because they do me better. And I, that's why I did Fremont West, did the Hollywood Bowl, I did all these. But the way I, I registered for the draft when I was 18, I never knew I was adopted, had no idea I had a history of any kind. And so I'm sitting in a restaurant one day and this woman, well, I had just registered for the draft, this woman walks up and she said, uh, sit down, I need to talk to you. And she was only 14 years older than me. She went what she did. So if I was uh, 18, uh, she'd be 32. And she's pretty good looking. And she, was, she looked like an Indian. And uh, so she said, sit down, I got to talk to you. I said, uh, okay. And she says, uh, I'm your mother. Said, what? She said, you mean they never told you you were adopted? And I said, no, nobody ever told me. And she said, well, uh, I'm half Kickapoo Indian, half Scotch. Your father's Jewish. 
and your third cousin is Roy Rogers and Spade Cooley and Wesley Tuttle and all those people. And then all of a sudden, it made sense to me why all I thought about 24 hours a day was music and none of them, the rest of them in the family had any clue about any kind of music, see? And uh, so it all made sense. So I went back with her, I went back up to Seattle. I had already cut a bunch of things at uh, Ramsey Studio, you can look that up, Floyd Ramsey, that's where uh, Dwayne Eddy did all of his hits, Al Casey was there, the Teddy Bears cut there, Lou Adler cut there, all kinds of people. It was a big famous studio and it's still there to this day, started in 1950. And uh, they've cut so many million sellers there, it's unbelievable. <clears throat> but anyway, so I had already gone up there starting when I was about 14 and cut several sides, all kinds of sides. And so <clears throat> I went back with her, I went back up to Seattle and I had to make a living. And so I went down to, down to Tacoma, they had a whole strip of clubs and there was one place called the Britannia Club. and. Uh, there was a guy in there who was the leader of the band, the lead singer, and he'd never been to Hollywood yet. He'd never cut a record before in his life. And his name was Buck Owens. He was the band leader. And so I walked up to him and I said, I sing rock and roll, I play drums, I play bass, I play steel, I play electric guitar, I play everything. And he said, you really do all that? He said, get up here and sing. Uh, Rock Around the Clock. So I got up there and sang Rock Around the Clock, and he says, okay, I'm going to hire you. Fifteen bucks a night. Well, I'd already been making 75 bucks a night when I was 14, but I was the leader in the band and the whole show. So he says, get up here and sing. So I got up here and sang, and the crowd just went nuts, you know. And, he, and so he pulled me aside. He said, you really can't play all those instruments? And I said, yeah. And he said, uh, go play some drums back there. So I got on the drums, and then I got on the steel, and and uh, anyway, Mel Taylor was the drummer. He was in the Ventures. They'd walk, don't run. And uh, Don Markham later was world, worked for Merle Haggard, the band leader. And uh, so I, so he says, okay, I'm gonna pay you 15 bucks a night to sing rock and roll. And when anybody has to go to the restroom, you play their instrument. And so, so that's how I got started. <laughs> but I couldn't make enough money, so I went out during the day and I worked in the pecan orchards, picking pecans and uh, persimmons and all that kind of crap. And one day a guy had his car door open and I heard this song playing. And I said, somebody stole my song. It was called It Was I. It was my first million seller, Skip and Flip. But I heard this song playing, so I ran over to the radio station and said, uh, Brent Records, uh, It Was I. It had my name on there as a writer and it said Skip and Flip. So I called New York and I said, uh, who in the world is just skipping and flipping? He said, we've been looking for you for six months. Uh, the record's already number 47 on Cashbox and Billboard. Can you be here Saturday night? This is Tuesday. Can you be here Saturday night and be on the Saturday night Dick Clark show and then fly over to Philadelphia Monday with Fabian and Bobby Rydell and be on the uh, American Bandstand? And I said, I ain't got no money. I ain't got no clothes. I ain't got no car. I ain't got nothing. He said, just go down to the airport, there'll be money for clothes, your tickets will be waiting, and he says, we'll pick you up at the airport in New York. And I had never lived anywhere but Coffeyville, Kansas, and Tucson, and I'd never seen a building over five stories high. And so I get on the plane, I'd never flown before, so I get on this plane, and I fly back there, and they pick me up, and uh, in this big limousine, and they take me down to 7th and Broadway. And for three days I goobered, I'm going, going, because I'd never seen a building over five stories high before. And so immediately I went over after we stayed there and did this Dick Clark show and, and uh, all of that. Uh, Dick says, I want you on my tours. Okay, so we. Uh, we went, we went over to Philadelphia and with uh, Fabian and Bobby Rydell and I forget Freddie Cannon and a bunch of others going to be uh, on the tour. You know, oh, Annette, Frankie Avalon, Annette, and uh, the Coasters, and uh, somebody else that was big at the time. Uh, a woman, I can't remember her name. Anyway, she was a big star. Uh, anyway, so we go over there and I went from 
fifteen dollars a day to five thousand dollars a night. Quite a jump in salary. Well, whenever you have no education and you're stupid, that's really bad. It took me fifteen years to get over it. Uh, what, I mean, what I mean by that is I, I be started doing <coughs> drugs and started doing every, because see in them days every road in America except for a little bitty piece of Pennsylvania and Turnpike and a little bit over by Tulsa was two lane road. So I got this nine, I have this nine passenger station wagon and a, an equipment with 2,800 pounds of equipment in it and you got to drive all over America on two lane roads. You get behind it. You get behind three or four log trucks in Colorado. It'd be 75 cars. I said. So I did that for about five years, and I started riding the bus though, with the Dick Clark tours and the Alan Freed tours, and uh, we'd play all these places like uh, according to which hit they were going by. And if they were going by, it was I and, uh, and Cherry Pie. Sometimes we did the tours with Freddie Cannon and Frankie Avalon and all of them, like we went to Hawaii and all that crap. And then, uh, but if it was Cherry Pie when it was number one, we'd be on the black tours with Jackie Wilson and Bo Diddley and Chuck Berry, there wouldn't be any white people with us, see. So I remember in 19, uh, 59, late 59 or early 60, we went down to the Omni Hotel in Atlanta and they wouldn't let any of the black entertainers stay in the hotel. So, me and Skip were the only uh, white people on the whole tour. So they took us across the tracks over to the black hotels and they assigned four big black guys to each one of us to protect us because everywhere we would go down there, they'd say, what are these crackers doing down here? What are these crackers doing down there? And so that got, that's where I got the name Cracker Packs. So that's what they started calling me in all the black tours, you know what I mean? And literally, uh, I was on about half black tours and half white tours because of the kind of hits we had, you know. And then when Alley Oop came out uh, in 1959, uh, last of 59, and it became a hit in March of 1960, well then I had the Hollywood Argyles, my own band, and so we did Hollywood Argyles and uh, Skip and Flip. And like I say, when I didn't want to go out, I'd go down and get Jimmy Seals and I'd say, okay, you go out and be the, I'm, in, I'm tired, I've been on the road with these two lane roads for four months and I'm tired. So I'd get Jimmy Seals to go out and, and I'd pay him 4000 a night and I'd keep 1000 and then I would take my band and I'd go down to all of the, because uh, Bruce Johnson was in my band and his mother was the music professor at UCLA and so we'd go to all these, what do you call them, uh, what are they, for all the fraternity, fraternity parties. Party. I can make 2500 bucks a night doing fraternity parties with my hit records and all and a thousand a night coming from Jimmy Seals being out on the road to the Hollywood Argyle so I was making 3500 a night and I can go home. Now Allie, you mentioned <laughs> that song, did you pin that song? No, Dallas Frazier. I was driving down the road one night, I, I helped rewrite it but he wrote it, Dallas Frazier who wrote Elvira later too. And the first song that he ever had recorded was Alley Oop. I was driving down the road one night from Seattle to Hollywood and I was about to run out of gas. And <clears throat> boy, you just didn't do that in the middle of the night on, I think it was Highway 5 or 95 or whatever it was. And back, way back in the distance, about two or three miles, I could see some lights. And I said, well, I wonder if, if that's some place that could possibly be a gas station. So I. I'm about to run out of gas. I got over there, I walk in this all night gas station, and two guys are sitting on top of a desk. One was Dallas Frazier, the other was Buddy Mines. And so, who later wrote a lot of big hits too, and him and I wrote a lot. But anyway, they're sitting there and uh, they said, hey, we saw your picture on the front of Teen Screen Magazine, Skip and Flip, right? I said, yeah. And uh, I said, what do you guys do? And he said, well, I was, uh, Dallas said, I'm a writer. You want to hear a song? And I said, yeah. So he played me Alley Oop. But it was like a country song. There's a man in the phone. He played it real fast, I guess. I said, well, let's make it into a rhythm and blues song. So we worked on it. And I said, okay, I'm, moving, I'm going to Hollywood. I don't know where I'm going to be. I don't have nowhere to go there. I'm just going to go there and uh, find me a place and I'll call you. And so... Uh, 
I went down there and uh, and I called him and he came down there and Cliffy Stone had an office right across the corner from uh, Sunset and Vine and Cliffy Stone had the town hall party which was the Sunday afternoon version of the Grand Ole Opry and on the show he had Buck, Buck Owens, Merle Haggard, Freddie Hart, Wynn Stewart, Tommy Collins, Tennessee Ernie, Polly Bergen, Molly B. He owned all these stars, managed all of them, and blah, 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 blah. And there was a lot more, too. Bobby Bear, and there was a place across the street called Happy Chevron Station. It was right between NBC on the corner and the Lawrence Welk Palladium. And so I didn't have no place to stay. We didn't have nothing we could do, so Happy had two grease bays. He would raise one of them up and put two or three sheets of one-inch plywood on it, and he'd let us sleep on them at night. And there when he... <laughs> And so I got some cards printed up that said, Maverick Music. I didn't get paid on a bunch of records. I said, how come I didn't get paid? They said, the publisher screwed you. And I said, what's a publisher? So I went over and started my own publishing company at VMI, and the first song I published was Alley Oop. And so we were sleeping on these <laughs> plywood pieces in this service station, so I had them come out and put a pay phone on the edge of the service stage, <laughs> got these cards printed up, and every time the phone would ring, I'd run over there and say, Maverick Music! <laughs> That's how I got started, walking that. There's the shoes, you see those shoes there? That's the shoes I walked the streets of Hollywood for two years, because they kept having hits and never got paid. And so, this one, this one got so bad you couldn't even, I mean, they had them resold so many times they couldn't even resell them anymore. Gary, read the plaque. Oh, I'll let you, uh, I'll let her read it. Mary, read I don't know what it says. Until your shoes look this worn out from walking company to company trying to get a deal until you've walked the streets in Hollywood and Nashville trying to succeed this hard. I won't listen to your sad stories, and I won't believe you can't make it by Gary S. Paxson, <laughs> Sr. That was in May 18, 1991, so. But that's, that's true. I mean, uh, uh, if you, if you want to make it, uh, Zig Ziglar, I used to produce him. You ever heard of him? Certainly have. The Motivation Speaker. Yes. I did two albums on him. And one of the things he said that really impressed me a lot, that was in the 70s, he said, nobody can make a failure out of you without your complete cooperation. Pretty true statement. Yeah. And then when I had went, when I was 18, I'd gone in to read for a movie part. I didn't get the part, but I, this really wise butt director, he had a sign over the back of his de desk, a big sign. Uh, and so I got it made up, and I've had it behind my desk in my office ever since. That was about nine. Well, I was uh, 18 or 19. <coughs> It was before 1960. It says, if you can see somebody, you're still in the crowd. Pretty good saying. Yeah, and I've gone by both of those my entire time in the music business. We're going to take another break. As I promised, we're going to hear some of the songs that he has written and some of the people that have recorded some of these songs. Again, we're visiting in the home of Gary S. Paxton Sr. in Branson, Missouri today. So and my wife, King. Vicki Sue, yes. is here. Well, I call her my warden. She keeps me out of trouble. Mm -hmm. See, if I'd had her 30 years ago, I'd be worth 2 or $3 billion. <laughs> well, it's always to have someone, a good woman behind everybody. Oh, yeah. Amen. And that's yeah. it. Stay tuned. We'll be back right here on TV7. I'm already on. I'm waiting for him. I love you. Okay, he's I'm got at, you. I'm looking at him here. Oh. Um, and we're back with Gary S. Paxton Sr. And you take a look at some of the outfits that he has worn throughout his career. And these were specially designed, specially made. Yeah, people made them for me. I'm going to put another one on here a second. Okay, mm -hmm. just go right ahead. Mm -hmm. As an entertainer, you've got to have Grandpa a This is Grandpa Rock. So, see? Grandpa Rock. Yeah, that's. I'm not Gary S. Paxton anymore. I'm Grandpa Rock. That's my new character. New character. Well, that's a good character to be. I've been working on it since 1981. It's getting about ready to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to talk with you. I've, I've been promising the viewers, we've been talking about your life. We've been talking about your move to Hollywood. Some of the top names in the 60s and all the, and on up that you've worked with. 
Tell me the first song that you have written that was recorded that went number one. Well, uh, let me see, probably. In what field? Doesn't matter, just the very first one that really is stands out, the person that recorded your song. Well, uh, one of the main ones is Woman's Interest Woman that uh, Don Gibson had a, sold a million and seventy one, and Ray Charles sold a million and a half in eighty four, and Mark Chestnut sold three and a half million in ninety three, and it was a uh, kind of country. Uh, then I've had he was there all the time as a gospel song I wrote that has been recorded over a hundred times in five or six languages all over the world in Chinese. They sent me the sheet music, but they won't send me the record. But anyway, it's been recorded, uh, uh, it's sold about five million by a hundred uh, together, all together, a hundred artists. One of the first main ones to cut it was Jimmy Swagger. He sold half a million. That's when he had his television show in 73. Right. And then he cut another one that Bill and Gloria Gaither, we've written a lot of songs together, uh, called More of You, and it sold a half a million. And uh, I don't know, I just had, I've been in so many hit albums and and produced so many different. The first one that I produced that sold a million was It Was I, and then Cherry Pie was second, and third was Alley Oop. And probably the one that's lived on the most is Monster Mash. It's get bigger. It's been 49 years and I haven't touched it one time, and it gets bigger every year. When it's did, over 10 million now. When did the transition from being a, a maybe a musician and singer uh, to being a producer take place in your career? Well, I, I always, uh, well, like when I did, I produced my records when I was a 14 year old kid. Uh, and uh, That was more for yourself, right? No, I wanted to be a star. <laughs> but I mean for other people, like people like Don Gibson who recorded it and people like Jimmy Swaggart who recorded it. When you were producing at a very young age. I really started producing when I was about 12 years old. and. Uh, and just kept going and one thing led to another, led to another, led to another and then I, I got into the major artist producing when I was in Hollywood. I was only uh, 19 or 20 years old. I was doing The Four Freshmen, the number one jazz group in the world. I was doing Thelma Houston who went on to be a big star. I was doing Richard Berry that did Louie Louie. I was doing uh, Paul Revere and the Raiders that I discovered in an A&W root beer stand in Boise, Idaho. When I was traveling to Skip and Flip, I went through there when uh, Cherry Pie was a hit, and Paul says, him and his wife owned a root beer stand, said, please take us to Hollywood and record us, and I said, okay, well, I went back the next year when Alley Oop was number one, and then I did take them down, uh, then, and in 61, I took them to uh, Hollywood and recorded their first million sellers, like Long here, and he still plays it in his show every night, and uh, it was on this little label that didn't pay us, and so, you know, we, we had three million sellers and we didn't get paid. And uh, so he kind of got discouraged. He was a conscientious objector because he was Mormon. And when the Vietnam War broke out, he refused to go. And so this is what the government, how they act. They made him empty bedpans in an insane asylum in Portland, Oregon for two years because he wouldn't go to the war. But he was a conscientious objector. He wasn't supposed to go. You know, and, mm. but they just because he was in the entertainment business, they took it out on him. See, I want to talk with you for just a moment because I want to bring in when you became a Christian, when you came to know the Lord. But before I do, you got into even though very successful songwriter, producer, and all, you became part of the drug scene. Am I right? Oh, for sure, yeah, a major part of it. Uh, like I say, I was uh, taking whites to get up every morning, take black beauties all day. I was chewing peyote, that's a Indian, purple Indian cac cactus. And uh, I never did take heroin because I saw a friend of mine take heroin and die. I said, I think that's one I'll stay away from. I never did do that, but I did everything else you could think of. And uh, I wound up in 68, I moved to Bakersfield to get away from all the alcoholism because everybody I knew and drug addiction. Everybody I knew was into alcohol and drugs. Well, I moved up there and started trying to, I bought an old bank building 
10,000 square foot bank building because it had this huge uh, bank vault where, so I, that I used for echo chamber. It was the best echo in the whole, that whole part of the country. Well, during while I was there, they had the Indians all invaded Alcatraz. So I was in the Indian invasion of Alcatraz, and uh, I've got, oh, probably 25 hours of film of all of that. Uh, and uh, we rented a big boat and went out there with the Indians, and, uh, and it was really quite an experience, you know. And so then I came back and uh, got so heavy, got back heavy into drugs. I had a music store. At one time in Bakersfield, I had two studios, 10,000 square feet, and then another in about 2,000 square feet. I had a music store covered about 10,000 square feet. I owned a whole bunch of buildings, uh, rental property buildings. I also owned uh, the first Pony Express Hotel halfway between Bakersfield and Tehachapi because the walls on each side were a thousand feet high and that's why the they, Pony Express had their hotel. Uh, yeah, and, their, uh, and the 28 cabins. They had a hotel and 28 cabins called Democrat Hot Springs. So I bought that and, uh, and it had been since 1847 or 57, something like that. But anyway, uh, and then down at the bottom, it was on the Kern River, and down at the bottom, Earl Haggard had a big ranch there. And uh, so I, four times a year, I would rent Democrat Hot Springs out, literally, to the Hells Angels. And I also had this Lake Ming Marina. I owned a marina there, and I'd have Steppenwolf and all these big rock stars come in and do a concert every two weeks. But, the, but I would rent the uh, Democrat Hot Springs, uh, to the Hell's Angels, and they would bring about 5,000 Hell's Angels in four times a year, and uh, they would have two semi truck flat bag beds with marijuana bales that weighed 75 pounds a piece. <laughs> and they never got caught. Yes, they got caught. The, the, <laughs> the, the uh, police at the Tehachapi Prison, uh, it was 90 miles from Merle Haggard's ranch at the bottom of the Kern River up to Tehachapi. And the police closed the uh, thing at Tehachapi because when you went down the other side, you're in the Mojave Desert. And then the fire department and the police closed the bottom right by Merle Haggard's, uh, Merle Haggard's ranch there because they knew you get 5,000 Hell's Angels pushed out of shape. And uh, so they just kept both ends and kept them all contained in there, you know. And I had this one Indian friend that I had taken to Alcatraz. He was six foot six. I worked with the Yaki Indians a lot up in the Kern River because uh, they were so poor. All the Yaki Indians, of course, it never got very cold in Bakersfield uh, ever, even, even in the wintertime. But all these Yaki Indian little kids, they lived in cars, old abandoned cars in these riverbeds up there. And it just really hurt me a lot. So I would take food up to him and me and this other Yaki Indian who was from that area. He was a six foot six Yaki Indian. Dennis Payne was his name. And uh, like I say, we were the ones that went to Alcatraz, but we would take food up to these Indians, you know what I mean? And every time the Hells Angels would rent the place from me, he was about six foot six and I was five foot seven. And they would make us wear bib overalls and our hammers in our side and they called us the Carpenter Twins. <laughs> now let me ask you, there had to be a transition period after you figure out drugs were not going to lead you anywhere in life. Well, I, I wasn't me to figure it out. I was, being in a, I was in, a, in a mental institution the first time for alcoholism and I was in for drug addiction the second time. And then I had moved to Nashville and I got just as heavy in it there. I was in jail all the time down there and I was always in trouble. And I met a guy down there who I'd known about. His name was Thomas Wayne Perkins, and it was Carl Perkins' cousin. It was Luther Perkins' brother, but he went under the name of Thomas Wayne, and he had a big multi-million seller called Tragedy. Right. Right. Well, him and I decided we were going to revive Skip and Flip and Hollywood Argyles, and so me and Thomas and Buddy Mize and all of us, we did a rock and roll version of, of, of there was whiskey and blood on the highway, and I didn't hear nobody pray. We did it like the Rolling Stones. <laughs> And we couldn't get nobody to uh, put it out, obviously. That was about 1971. And uh, Thomas was having a lot of trouble with drugs. 
And uh, so he committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And uh, that really got to me a lot. So I went out to his funeral and his brother had already, was Johnny Cash's guitar player, his brother had already burned up in a house, in a, he lived in a little house trailer and smoked in bed and he burned up. And uh, so there was a lot of tragedy in all of Johnny Cash's things, all these people, things happening to him. And uh, Johnny was a wonderful person. I worked with Johnny a lot. All those Dean Martin 42 country, Dean Martin country shows, my vocal group did all of those. Janie Fricky was my soprano. Diane Tidwell was my alto. So I did all those Dean Martin country shows. I think there's 42 of them out on Johnny Cash's ranch. And I'd been working with Johnny since 1951 on tours and things, you know. And uh, I remember one night in Moline, Illinois, they were said the poster, it says, the Hollywood Argyles, somebody else, and Johnny Cash. And I told Johnny, I said, I'm so embarrassed because I'd already known him a lot. I said, you're the big star. And he said, Whoever's record's number one, they're on the top of the poster. <laughs> so, anyway, so I went out to the funeral, Thomas Wayne's funeral, and I put my hand on his face, and he was as hard as a rock and cold as ice. And it wasn't an audible voice, but a voice said, Life ain't no movie, and there ain't no reruns. And I had just gotten out of jail. Uh, they used to love to put me in jail because I had hair. I would walk around the streets in Nashville and I had blonde hair clear down to my waist and I would wear these black tight boots, and, uh, uh, Hitler boots and Hitler uh, pants and I would have that sword that you see right over there. I would wear that sword and I had a flag that I'd found in the top of that old house in Hollywood that had 48 stars and I wore that for a cape up and down Music Row and I would take all of my songs around in two Kroger bags, <laughs> paper bags, and all these different A&R people, they said, we hated to see you coming up the walk to our office because we knew that you were going to have something, and if we didn't cut it and it was a big hit, we'd get fired, and if we did cut it and wasted a lot of money on it, it wasn't a hit, we'd get fired. <laughs> Either way. So they <laughs> said, so we were really scared of you. So but anyway, the police, uh, the police, I'd, I'd always, I'm sure it'd be something I'd say back to them, I'd smart off to them, they'd come to get me in, on the street or in some club or in somebody's house where I was going crazy, drinking. Because uh, when you're doing that many drugs and peyote and uh, two-fifths of tequila every day, that's quite a bit of stuff, you know. And so police would arrest me time after time after time, and they loved to... They'd take all my clothes off, and I have nothing but my shorts on, and then they'd take my blonde hair and they'd drag me up and down the hallways. And, you know, they'd pull big spots of hair out, you know, and they kicked me so many times one time that it broke the elastic on my shorts and they had to take me in the hospital. Well, I was going to sue them, and my attorney said, if you sue them, you're dead because... They'll catch you coming in your house one night and they say, oh, we thought it was a burglar and they'll blow you away, see. So I didn't sue them, but uh, that was how most of my life was at that time. And so uh, there was a, on right on Music Row, there was a church called Belmont Fellowship. And uh, that's where Archie uh, Boone and his, that was Pat Boone's father, they went there. Don Francisco went there. Scott Wesley Brown went there. So many stars went to that church. Amy Grant was a little kid, about 14 years old. She'd come in here and sit down. And uh, there was at least 50 music business stars because across the street they had a Christian bookstore called Koinonia, out on the corner. And uh, Charlie Daniels would be in there and Billy Walker. and They'd have Connie Smith. They'd have stars in there every day who were Christians in the Christian bookstore. They had a stage and they'd be in there entertaining every day. And uh, Belmont fellowship they had it was called Belmont Church of Christ but little by little they snuck the drums over and then they snuck a piano over and then they snuck a guitar in and somebody reported them to the Church of Christ down in uh, wherever it was Waco or her down there where the head of the Church of Christ was they got a rock band going in the Belmont fellow Belmont Church of Christ and so Don Fento was the preacher and uh, 
They said, we're going to throw you out of the Church of Christ. He said, you don't have to. So he got a big sledgehammer. He went out and busted the sign all up and had them put up Belmont Fellowship. And it, now they built, they stayed right there and they built another church right next to uh, Columbia there. It holds 4,000 people and they're full twice every Sunday. You know, I want to stop for just a and second. And that's where I got saved. Uh, they kept telling me, you need to get saved. And I said, from what? And they said, from yourself. But now, didn't you like to die at one point in your career? Many times. But I think your life was threatened at this point in your career. Oh, yeah, I was always being threatened. But uh, I probably deserved it. But anyway, uh, I, I go in there, and, uh, and I was pretty drunk when I went in. And they said, well, why don't you come back next Sunday night? So I went back the next Sunday night, stoned. And I went down to the altar and got saved. And I said, well, let's just go ahead and baptize me. That you got it, you need to get baptized. I said, let's do it right now. And I quit everything. I mean, I was doing two fifths of tequila, reds, peyote, black beauties all day, reds at night, everything you can think of. And I had this big English pipe and I put marijuana seeds in it. So when I'd light it, they go Psh, up in the air and wanna make all the crowd laugh, you know. And so I I went I went cold turkey. I quit everything in one night. And they said that they said no. You just need to change to beer and just uh, change to uh, quit smoking your cigars. I had those big old Marsh Wheelings, you know. I didn't inhale them, but they said uh, and just start drinking beer. And I said, Jesus is real or he ain't. And I quit everything. And I was in and out of the hospital constantly for about five months because cold turkey from that much stuff after 15 years, I literally almost died several times. And uh, anyway, then in 1980, it was December the 29th, 1980, I had this artist under contract uh, and I cut 10 top 10 hits on him. He was under contract to me and I leased him to Warner Brothers and his name was Vern Gosden. And I had uh, 10 top 10 hits on him and five of them made the top three. And he became a big star. He went from $500 a night to $25,000 a night. And so he came and said, uh, I want to do a drinking album. And I said, I told you, Vern, when I signed you, I'm a Christian. I do not do drinking or jump in the back seat albums or none of that. And he said, we, so we went to court and I won. And he said, I'm going to kill you for this. Well, I didn't take him very serious. So one night, December the 29th, somebody knocked on the door. I went outside. And these two guys said, uh, can you help us get our car started? It's right over here. And uh, I didn't see no car. And they said, well, it's down at the corner, so you'll have to drive. So I got in the van, and I, and I had the lights on. I could see, and I saw this pipe coming. And the guy hit me in the head with the pipe. And the other guy jumped on top of me. He had a 38. He stuck it right up to my throat. And so I said, in the name of Jesus, you can't kill me. But they... They shot me four times. They beat my head in with a pipe, broke both of my shoulders, and pulled this one out of its socket. And even with, and I had my seatbelt on, I couldn't get out. So even with my uh, broken shoulder, I got it back over, and I said, "Give me that gun." And so I got the gun and blew a hole clear through the guy. And so then they jumped out and ran. And uh, so I got in, and I fell out, and I'm crying to crawl. It was a business district. It was a recording studio at the end of a street with a cul-de-sac and there was nobody no people lived in the area well, there was one old couple who lived way down at the end of the corner who my kids when they come to see me from texas they would go down and play with their grandson and so <clears throat> i get up and lean against the telephone pole then i'd crawl to the next uh, tree and i'd get up and then i'd crawl to the next telephone pole and i'd get up and it took me about a half hour to get to the end of the street down there a block away. And I knocked on the door, and I, by that time I just covered with blood from one end to the other, and you're hyperventilating, so they can't. And uh, so uh, they opened, the, I knocked on the door, they opened the door, and I heard the ambulance coming. You know, and it, it stopped, and then it left. What they did was he had crawled up on the road, the guy I shot crawled up on the road, and got in the ambulance, and they took him to General Hospital. <laughs> And here I am, so I knock on these people's door. They come to the door, they were about, they were old. 
And so they started screaming and slammed the door. And so I be kept pounding and pounding. I said, finally got it out. I'm Gary, and my daughters play with your grandson. Oh my goodness, what, what do you want us to call, call the police? And I said, no, I want you to call Don Fento, my pastor, Bob McKenzie, who was the president of Benson Records. Ron Huff was my partner in the studio. I want you to, I, get named, I said, get my wallet out and call all these people. He said, well, we need to call the police. I said, I ain't going to do no good. If I die, I want to, I want to be with my preacher and all my, all my partners and everything, Christian partners. <laughs> anyway, so they sent another ambulance, and this is how God works. The guy, I wouldn't let him carry me. I walked to the ambulance. I get on the ambulance. They, I wouldn't lay down on a gurney. I sat up and leaned against the wall, and there was a young kid in there. And I, I heard him go across the railroad tracks by the Nashville Speedway. I said, I told you to take me to Vanderbilt. You're taking me to General Hospital. If you don't turn around and take me to Vanderbilt, I will get out and walk. And this kid says, I've got all of his albums at home, and he's telling you the truth. I said, I don't care if you're going 35, 50 miles an hour. I'll jump out, and I'll get up, and I'll walk three miles to Vanderbilt. So they turned around <laughs> and took me to Vanderbilt. Well, by that time, it was on TV and the newspapers. And there was about 1,000 people there in front of the hospital. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of strange. Didn't, but see, I missed the first ambulance, and I got the second ambulance that had a Christian male nurse in there that had all my albums. And he knew what I said on my albums, that I meant what I was talking about. I would have jumped out and walked all the way, to, and I'd have made it too. So I go in there, and I'm in there, uh, they got eight doctors in there working on me, and I had about eight, I had made all my friends come in, they said, get these preachers out of here, and I said, if you make them leave, I get up and leave. So they let them stay in there, and I got eight doctors, and I heard it go, beep, three times. Did you know that your hearing lasts for two and a half minutes after you die? So I was still talking to him and everything. And then I heard this one big German doctor, she was about six foot four. She said, if we don't get his shoulder back in the socket, we're gonna have to amputate his shoulder and arm. And I said, I'm a guitar player and a bass player. You ain't taking nothing off. I said, go ahead, get back in there. She put her foot up in my armpit and took my arm and went, yeah. And I peed straight up in the air. I mean, it hurt so bad. I couldn't, I was hurt so bad, I couldn't even feel the four gunshots. They, they shot me four times with a 38, and I never did even fail it. And so, then they said, well, we got to go take x-rays. I walked all the way down to the x-ray place. We did the x-rays. I walked back. It was probably 150 feet. And they said, guess, and I'm sitting there in a chair. And they said, guess what? It didn't work. we got to do it again. But, but we'll take you under the gurney this time. I said, no, you won't. I walked down there again, walked back. And uh, I walked to the elevator, and they took me to a room upstairs and put me in the hospital room. But I know, I, because God told me, if you pass out, you'll die. And as long as you're walking, walking around and standing up and everything, you can't fall asleep, see? So uh, anyway, it's pretty interesting. It's very interesting. <laughs> Almost unbelievable when you've been shot four times and still able to walk, you know. A well, lot I, of people would think, well... Can that really be real? But you know what? The broken shoulder and out of its socket, and uh, they beat me so bad with my that my eyes were swelled shut. They couldn't even I couldn't even hardly see, and I was covered with blood, and they beat my head so bad and it hurt so bad when they pulled my shoulders out of the socket and broke them that I couldn't even feel them four gunshots. I didn't even feel the four gunshots at all because I was already in so much pain from the head beating. I mean, they beat my head to the pipe at least 10 minutes. Well, you know, I think the amazing part- And know, then broke, and like I say, broke my shoulder and pulled it out of the side. Is that they did apprehend the people. Of course, one of them was in the hospital. Yeah, but uh, I kept saying, in the name of Jesus, you can't kill me. In the name of Jesus, you can't kill me. And, you know, it was like every demon in hell kept trying to kill me even more. But they lived, and they did uh, go to trial. Okay, yeah, but uh, Vern, Vern uh, they told, one was named Daryl Langley, the other was named Daryl Bailey. And Daryl Dale, Dale, Dale Bailey was a pretty good kid. 
they were both under 25, and so they put him in a minimum security place over at Cookville, and he got saved in one of my friend's prison ministry. <laughs> now, how weird is that? Shows you how God can work. That's right. And so, so they went to court. We all went to court. Took about a year. Went to court. And they wouldn't testify against Vern because Vern had said, well, I hired you. I, I paid you $3,000 worth of cocaine to kill him, a total stranger. If you testify against me, I'll kill your mother, I'll kill your wife, and I'll kill all your kids. So they wouldn't testify against him. See, so they went to Brushy Mountain for six years each. And then, like I say, one got moved to Cookville. And he got, he got uh, saved in one of my friend's prison ministry. Then I had another problem after, they got, after he got out. They both got out. And the one, Daryl Bailey, uh, he killed his next door neighbor and they put him back in Brushy Mountain forever. He'll never get out. But Daryl Langley, uh, he, like I say, he got saved. And so then he started calling me every day. And he finally came up. He says, God told me I was supposed to be your bodyguard. <laughs> I said, how come he never told me? I said, you couldn't kill me. How's somebody else going to kill me if he don't? If he's got angels around me in the blood of Jesus, and, and how's somebody else going to kill me? And so finally, after about six or eight months, he quit coming up. Finally, I let him come up the one time, and he got out on the floor and he crawled across, and he had his hands around. He had his hands around my feet, and he was kissing my boots. I said, "Daryl, get up!" He said, "I got to be forgiven. I got." I said, "I forgave you, and God forgave you." 15 minutes after you murdered me because if you don't forgive, you won't be healed. And I didn't want to die. So I said, I forgave you 15 minutes after you murdered me. See? And so I understand now he's doing real well and he even had a, he got, I think he was married and he got kids and had a Christian bookstore. Well, I tell you, I want to talk in the last few minutes that we have. I want to talk about the song that probably everybody in our viewing area has heard. I know we have. Uh, well, I, I want to, I want to talk about my wife, too. I want you to talk about her, too. We may go longer then. But I do want to talk about he was there all the time. Get a black chair and come over here. Yes, come, come over on. here, Vicki. Senior here in Branson, Missouri. Yes. Singer, songwriter, producer. We've listened to a lot of the li his life story. Poor, of course, we probably could record several hours of his life story, but we only tried to hit the highlights. And the thing we want to show the viewers now is uh, uh, where the Lord has brought Gary Paxton Sr. to. You know, uh, from the drug scene, the music industry, the world of entertainment, he's brought you full circle around. And he saved you uh, from some life-threatening situations many times. many times from the drugs and alcohol yeah. that is so often and associated was, with the I music murdered, industry. Yes. Yeah. And, but I want to talk about a song that everybody, I guess, in our viewing area as well as probably around the world, yes. he was there all the time. How did this song uh, well, originate? this is what's really strange. I had just been working for... Uh, Buddy Lee, who's the number one agent in town, and Chet Atkins at RCA, and Danny Davidson, Nashville Brass, and uh, an attorney named Larry Green. They all owned a publishing company, and I, wrote, and I wrote 400 songs for them in three years. Well, then after my contract was up, of course, that's Woman's Interest Woman, Honeymoon Feeling was number one, Roy Clark, Don't Let the Good Times Fool You, number one, Melba Montgomery, all kinds of people. We had a lot of hits. and uh, but. Uh, then I started writing gospel after I got saved, uh, and the strange thing about it, I write at least 150, 200 songs a year, see, every year, and I still do. And uh, so one day I would go down there, I was partners in a company with Bob McKenzie, the president of Benson Records, Bill Gaither, uh, Ron Huff, the conductor of the Nashville Symphony, Doug Oldham on the Jerry Falwell Show, Joe Mascaleo that owned the Imperials, and I produced them and did no shortage. It was number one. We won a Grammy. Anyway, I did all of these things, and I and I would just keep turning these tapes into Bob McKenzie at Paragon, and he said, uh, "When did you write?" Uh, he was there all the time, and I said, "I don't even know what you're talking about," because I would hand in eight or ten songs on a tape, and he played it for me, and I don't even remember writing it. 
because I just wrote so many all the time. I write them, forget it, go to the next one, go to the next one. And I said to him at the time, I said, I prayed for 25 years that I had stolen them from somebody because I had this vocal group and we were on four sessions a day. We were on 50% of all the hits that came out of Nashville for eight years. You know, when uh, Anita Kerr moved to Switzerland, there was nobody to take her place because the Jordanaires, if it had more than four chords, they couldn't sing it, see? So I organized the Gary S. Paxton Singers right quick with Jamie Freaky and Diane Tedwell and all these people I had all had music degrees. And uh, so I was filling a void. And so whenever you have to walk into, you're doing four sessions a day, uh, every day for two, three, five, eventually 10 years, you have to walk in, they play you the tape twice, it's all right, and they write a number sheet down, or already have it written down, and you gotta start recording. So you have to absorb the song so fast. I said to McKinsey, I, God, I hope I didn't steal that song. I kept waiting for somebody to sue me, and they never did. <laughs> and so I honestly do not remember writing the song or thinking of the song, so that's good. Because what that proves to me is that the Holy Spirit wrote it. And it's never been a chart hit. It's been recorded over a hundred times in five or six languages. It's sold over five or six million, and it's never been a hit on the charts. And yet it's such a well-known yeah. It's a standard. It's in, hell, it's in uh, hymn books and everything else. And like I say, in different languages. And, and uh, so it's probably good that I can't remember anything about it. So I know I wrote it because nobody ever sued me. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I've seen your name on the when, uh, as you said, it's in many hymn books. Mm -hmm. I've seen it in a book I have, and it has your name on. I it. wish I could say. Well, I was sitting there one day, and I thought about this, and I thought about that, and. Uh, uh, that's why I've written over 3,000 songs and over 600 have been recorded and over 150 of them have been hits and at least 20 of them have been recorded over 100 times each. And I can't remember one word to any song and I asked God, why am I so stupid? He said, if I ever let you remember the words, you'll quit being humble and you'll think you're a big star and then you'll go back out in the world and you'll probably die and go to hell. But don't you think the song, He Was There All the Time, describes your life. He was with you all the oh, time. Oh, of course. From the time that you were adopted in Coffeeville, right, Kansas. Right, by accident. And, and to the time that... Uh, I was murdered. You were, you, well, you went to Hollywood to the drug scene. I was in the scene, nut house twice. And you were in a... Uh, 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 Might as well hospital. say nut house, because that's what it was. But you know, he was there all the time. That's exactly right. See? And it's not just with you. He's he, with everyone all the time. So many use it in their prison ministry, too. And he has wanted to change the words, rewrite it to be just for the prison ministries. He is there all the time. Yeah, and then I'll, I'll, I'll leave it like it is and then write another version of it so that when they get ready to sing the last chorus, they can, they can sing, have, they can have the crowd sing with him. He is there all the time watching over me, you know what I mean? Well, Waiting I did. patiently. The audience probably has uh, observed that we've added one more to our interview <laughs> oh. here. And I want you to introduce her. Oh, this is my warden. Your warden. Yeah. This Better known as your wife. Also known as my wife. Uh, this is Vicki Sue. Vicki Sue. She was the number one disc jockey in Springfield for 10 years at a big band station. So she, you know, she's really had a lot of experience in that area. And if I'd had her 30 years ago, I'd be worth 10 or $15 billion. <laughs> so she we said, we she have said, the same birthday, so I yeah, know. Yeah, we were born on the same day, and I said, well, I want to get married. We've been married, what, 11 years? Mm -hmm. I said, I want to get married on that day, so we won't have to have nothing to remember. You know, it's the same birthday, <laughs> same, and married, too, and she wouldn't let me down. So we got married so, on Valentine's Day. And he but, still can't remember that. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> anyway, I, it's Vicki Sue, and I said, see, everybody remembers Billy Ray and Billy Bob, so you're not going to be Vicky anymore, you're going to be Vicky Sue. Vicky Sue. For the last 10 years, now you're remembered, see? <laughs> right. And, and, and I, uh, literally, uh, I'd probably be in the nut house again, because, you know, I have a way of, <laughs> I have a way of just falling off the wagon. I mean, not falling off the wagon drinking, I haven't had, had no more drinks or drugs or anything, but, uh, I fall off the turnip truck because I'm too stupid to keep watching where He's we're going. He's a 24-7 maintenance guy. Is he? Yes. 
Well, it looks like you're doing a great job. Thank you. I, I, for, I since I was heart. since I was ten years old, I've never slept over two hours at a time. I sleep an hour and a half, two hours, and I wake up, and I gotta write something down, or I gotta remember something, or I gotta write what I'm supposed to do, and I forgot, and then I'll go back to sleep, and sometimes I won't sleep. Uh, any, not one. The other day, I, I was up from 8 o'clock in the morning till the a next afternoon. But I love Gary's heart, and I think part of it was I didn't want to be a singer and I didn't want to be a songwriter. I just knew his heart. It's hard to work together sometimes because she doesn't know nothing about the music business at all. When we started, she knows a lot now. And, uh, and she said, if we ever get another big hit, like some of those you've had before, <laughs> you can't leave the house without an attorney on one arm and a lawyer on the other arm, and I'll be right behind all three of you with a gun. <laughs> I thought the only song he had That's done good. was he was there all the time. Well, you know, everybody <laughs> associates that with him, and then when I began to research the yes. interview, I would begin to say so much more to Gary Paxton, and as you said, you have a story to tell, and I appreciate you sharing the story, but I want to ask one final question okay. as we close the interview. How would you like for people to remember Gary S. Paxton Sr.? Well, just I, I actually would rather they don't remember me at all and just remember my works because it's all Haywood and Stubble. And so if you remember the works, there's continuity in it, you know what I mean? I don't care if they remember me. I really don't. I don't want them to remember me because that takes away from how they think about the songs and the analyzing of the songs and the lyrics and everything, you know. So, but there's so many the world hasn't heard yet. When I, when I die, I, wanna, I was going to... You got to see that. I t first, I used to tell everybody when I've died, I want to be cremated and flushed. Mm -hmm. yeah. But no, I'm not going to do that. What I want to do is uh, be cremated and have the ashes taken over to the Mount of Olives and strung all over the bottom of the Mount of Olives. Well, somebody tried to do that, and the cops and the army came out there and everything, and so this friend of mine says, uh, I met this old man over there and he told me how to do it. He says, you go down to the thrift store and he gets you this old black coat that's all terrible looking and everything. And you put half the ashes in one pocket and half the ashes in the other. Then you get an ice pick and then you punch all of the holes in the inside of the pocket. And then you walk around and go, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And all around the bottom of the cross and the Calvary. And he said, all the ashes will be out there on the ground. Can so, I add two cents on So I'm going to have somebody do that. We, Gary's ministry, Gary S. Paxton Ministries, is a 501c3. Yeah. And I love this man's heart because my mother was at the nursing home for three years. My mother was a little angel out there. And we put bird feeders out, and yeah. bird feeders on a lot of the windows. And I think churches and communities have forgot a, a lot of the people in the nursing homes. And it's getting there. Because they're the people that uh, yeah. built the communities. Yeah, well, my mother had <clears throat> Alzheimer's, been in a nursing home for six years, too, so I know a lot about like But her mother, the, all those people, they lay there and they look out the window and they see these birds fighting at the and bird, bird feeders, feeders are and they just laugh birds. and go on. So, so that's one of the things we, we do. We have a deal with wild birds up here, Don and uh, Amy. And we buy food and we and buy we, different feeders when they go to the dining room and they watch feeders. And then, but uh, I'll tell you, bird seed just doubled, so it's costing about $150 a week just for bird seed. And then we have a, a we ministry. we got 29 feeders out at one nursing home. Uh, we have a young man that goes up to Ecuador, up in the mountains, mm -hmm. and yeah. he took the love of Jesus. One person made a difference, and the children don't wear shoes or socks. See, he goes up there in the mountains. He's, he was born in Cuba and raised in Florida, and he goes to Ecuador four times a year, and he goes up in the mountains where they've got in, in they got class things. In other words, if you don't belong in a certain class, they make you move out to the mountains, and it's seventeen thousand feet high up there. And Gary has. And you have to you have to drive up there in a four wheel, and the last two miles you have to walk on foot, and it's a thousand foot cliff. So we on pick the side. up socks and shoes at thrift stores. But anyway, there's about uh, there's probably about two thousand kids up there, eleven or twelve years old, and the last half inch of their toes yes. and fingers are missing because they've been frostbitten off. Mm. It's and cold up there. None of them have ever had a pair of shoes. None of them have ever had a pair of socks or a toy. So Most the, of them don't have a coat and they live in mud huts with a piece of tin so on the So we're top. so blessed here in America, but they wanted to know about Gary and I, why we cared about him. So Pedro, so Pedro Rodriguez, four times a year, 
Last time, now people are starting to go with him. And last time, what did he take? She, collect, she goes to all the thrift stores and collects all the shoes and socks. And he took, what, 500 pairs of shoes last time and socks and uh, toys. And then uh, she got up and spoke at the Sanctuary of Hope. And they took up a collection. And they got $11,000. One person can make a difference. And I think... And one man gave $10,000. And they now they've got a... On Bill top of this church. mountain, they're building a church. They bought them a little piece of land, and they're building the church up there. So I, I you talk about reaching out in the community. Because of what Pedro what, Rodriguez but started this is going what your, there. Your station does it. Right. It reaches to the community, and so many people sit at home and think they can't make a difference. Are a lot there. of people want to do something, but they don't but they know don't what, what to, to do. do. And, and Pedro Rodriguez has made a whole difference. I mean, and I always say to get out of self, get into service. That's right. Yeah. Well, you do have a website, and I do want to share yes. that with the viewers, yeah. and they can find out more about Gary S. Paxton. Yes. And we're getting ready to rebuild and put rebuild. a whole bunch more on it. It's GarySPaxton.com, and we have GarySPaxton.org and GarySPaxton.net. <laughs> right? That's right. Well, I tell you, it has been a joy to visit with you. And such a joy home. to have you in our really? home. And you come back. Oh, we will. We'll we come really back. appreciate you doing this. I can't imagine. I told her, I said, I can't imagine anybody wanting to do it. Well, what difference does it make? for the rest of the story, come back. For the re that's right. You only heard maybe five years of the 250 years. <laughs> well, we'll look forward to a return visit, and if you're in Bruce, Mississippi, we oh, want we you would to love to, to, be we would love to do that. And talk with us. Yeah. Thank and stay tuned to this station. <laughs>